So, Alexi, this is your second volume of autobiography, isn't yes. it? Yes. And this is the one, this deals with the sort of, with, well, with you becoming a stand-up, but also with the birth of, of stand-up as we understand it in the UK, really, which is why we're yeah. doing the interview here in the, the third version of the, yeah, of the comedy the original, store. But not the original, yeah. <laughs> but the um, original. <laughs> I mean, I've, I really, really enjoyed this. I thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. But it's not, it's not just a book about the birth of comedy, is it? It's a, it's a sort of, it's about a culture war in the 20th century as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I, I mean, it's attempting to do several things, really. Um, I think it's partly just a kind of social history, really, of trying to be an honest social history. Because I think one of the things that annoys me is often, you see, like, on telly, somebody like, what's he called, Dominic Sandbrook. Right. You know, making documentaries about the 80s when he was 12 or something. Well, why didn't he get? Yeah. I mean, Clive James typified it as he does history. His, his history is basically stuff his mum's told him. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, why don't you get somebody who's actually there? It's not like you're doing yeah. the Pharaohs and the Polly. You know, there's people right. like me and Polly and it was, there's people like me around. Yeah. And everything he does is like subtly wrong. So, so there's partly that is to, is to give an honest account of the sort of the period. I mean, what, what I thought when you were writing about the 70s is that, and, and it's really been brought into focus by what's happening in politics now, is that all the circumstances that allowed a, a working class man to go to college, muck around for three years, work out what they were doing, become on some level a sort of autodidact as well and have access to information and, uh, and have a, a, the little cracks in society where you could survive while you were figuring out what, what you wanted to do and then become a comedian playing to an audience in a town who could afford to live there to watch you. That is all gone. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was a brief... I, was, I mean, I think a friend of mine said, that, you know, the, the, in a sense, the right... The left makes the same mistakes over and over again. The right only mistakes makes a mistake once. And that briefly allowing people like me through the, the doors of the gates of El Dorado, yeah. allowing that to happen. Well, the, we're not, we're not doing that again. Yeah, well, I think you know? the, the problem is if you're of a certain age, that was your base level. So you sort of think that was the norm, but actually it was an exception, wasn't it? It, it was, was an exceptional period. exception yeah. where for a bit, everyone felt a bit bad about having blown everyone up in the <laughs> yeah, war. And they went, let's yeah. give them some yeah. hospitals and schools and colleges yeah. and things. I mean, that and now that's sufficiently long ago. You know? Yeah, now you can, we can reinstate the status quo. Yeah, yeah, it was a... I mean, I didn't know anything else. And in, and in a sense, you know, I... I, I I didn't value. I thought this was this would go on forever. This you know full grant, uh, yeah. you know allowed to go. To, I mean, I would spend five years at art school, and then yeah, I mean like I worked in the civil service, and that seemed like a kind of um, and because I was temporary. You you had to queue up to get your wages every week, and that the queue for the wages was like all people with long hair and yeah. all clearly in bands or mm. you know doing circuses or something. And that was the sort of, <laughs> yeah. the, the civil service was also a form of art yeah. subsidy. You didn't yeah. have to do any work. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I was, saying, I was saying there was enough work, in, there was four of us in my office and enough work for one trained chicken. Mm. And, you know, so that was a kind of subsidy. And then, I mean, accommodation was, was, was cheap. You know, you, yeah. you know, I lived in a council flat. And, um, yeah, it was just a, you know, it was just a wonderful age. And it was also an age of, and that made it an age of genuine experimentation, you know. I mean, yeah. I, mean I, I, I try not to be nostalgic because no. I think, you know, well, you, you had all that experimentation yeah. and, um, you know, freedom and subsidies, but coffee was terrible. So, yeah, you I know, know yeah. swings and rounds. Yeah, no, I remember the first time I had a decent coffee. It was in 1985, and I, I, th I didn't know such things existed. No. And it came with a, a bun which had seeds in it and lettuce. And normally a sandwich was just some meat, wasn't it, on a bit of butter. Yeah. And this, this thing had like, it had lettuce and tomato in the cot. And I, I thought, what, what is this? Epiphany, yeah. Yeah. It was, I, yeah, and so people sort of forget. I mean, right, jumping around a bit, but you writing about touring, and like how difficult it was in the late 70s, early 80s, to find anything to eat or yeah. anywhere to stay in Britain that yeah. wasn't off. <laughs> and I sort of caught the tail end of yeah. that in the late 80s, where most of where we'd stay was DSS uh, subsidised, you know, B&Bs and things, and you'd kind of be in that, because it wasn't mid-scale, it wasn't like the tri Premier Inn or anything. It didn't anything, matter how you much know. you paid, really. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, had, I wasn't, you know, I was playing big venues yeah. and stuff, but still everywhere you stayed was shit. You could, yeah. you could spend, didn't matter how much you spent, everywhere was horrible. Yeah. And on the motorway, I remember there was a chain called Red Hen, Red Hen, there was. Then yeah. they did like a cafetiera coffee, yeah, yeah. and so we used to seek out a Red Hen. It was still awful. <laughs> yeah, but 
But yeah, that thing of touring that was not like, and it was, you know, as I said, King's the Aim is like, some like bugger the customer, you know, it was like. So just jumping back a bit, yeah. right, you came to do, you came to do, aren't you, you, your first book describes brilliantly being brought up by a, a, a communist family, which again would seem incredible to anyone now <laughs> that there could have been communists in Britain and that it was fine to be a communist. Oh, well, it yeah. wasn't, you know, it was okay, it was a point of view. Trade union leaders were allowed to be communists, you know, you could have a, you could be a Marxist historian and you weren't like going to be lynched by a tabloid. Yeah. But so that, that you came to London doing art school and you, you sort of, you, you, the f first thing where you thought you could do comedy really was being in a Brecht play, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I was a, I was a, so I was no, a sorry, to, 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 what people yeah. have to understand is that none of this existed. There was no, no not until there was a me. working men's club comedy circuit yeah. of the same f 100 guys doing the same 500 old gags. But what we understand of the stand up, there was nothing really like that. You had you folk singer guys doing a little, doing the bits, four, Jasper yeah, Carrot yeah, and Jasper whatever, Jasper doing the bits yeah. in between. But so you had a sense you wanted to be funny and you weren't in a student review. What were you going to do? Exactly, yeah. No, I mean, at first I didn't. I mean, yeah, I mean, I sort of got into acting, performing fairly slowly, but um, there was this mate of mine called Cliff who was, um, he's, he'd been at school with me a couple yeah. of years older. His parents were also in the Communist Party. He came back, to, he'd been in Paris, he came back to Britain and he started this Brechtian troupe. Um, there was about ten of us doing songs and poems of Bertolt Brecht. Uh, you know, what a woman think, what the stripper thinks of while she's having an abortion or whatever, mm. you know. Uh, Sura by a Johnny, why am I feeling <laughs> you know, what's so really bad? Funny, right? you, you do that, but I can see all that in your early stand -up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's exactly the... like it sort of felt like, I mean, you watched it as Skinny thought, what is it like an East European performance artist or something? <laughs> yeah. It sort of, it but was very informed by that sensibility, isn't it? That's, you know? Again, that's that yeah. thing about, I always think, why not use everything? Yeah, you know, I used yeah. absolutely everything. I used the Brecht thing. I used aspects of performance mm. art that I'd seen at art school. You know, I I used my own experience living in, the, you know, yeah. working and living in the tower block and, uh, and all that. Because but do, why not? You know? But doing that, you write about how you worked out how to make the same bits funny every night and you felt like some of the actors didn't. That was the difference. That's yeah. the difference between, I think, in a way, actors yeah. and comics. The, when I was in the Brecht thing, yeah, they, or they get a laugh one night, mm. and then they sort of do try and do it different. And I'm like, I think, yeah. well, why have you got to get it? Yeah. You got it right. Why fuck with it? You know. Yeah. And I think that's quite. I, I think that I, I I felt very strongly that that was very disrespectful to comedy. You know, yeah. that you wouldn't. You well, know, were hit, were hit you writing that about after that wanting to put this sort of? Well, it's like a kind of review show, isn't it? The two of you, me and you, Bill, yeah, yeah, and Bill, um, Bill Monks, Bill, yeah, called, Bill Monks, yeah, yeah and, and sort of, but, and so, it's called uh, Never Mind the Bulk. No, oh, oh no, yeah, we were, we were called Thrippany Theatre, yeah, which yeah. was the Brecht cabaret, and then yeah. I think the show was called Never Mind the Bulk. Yeah, and yeah. trying to, and trying, but again, where did you, where did you place it then? I mean, that's another thing of people roughly contemporary, sort of John Dowie. I know he, well, there wasn't comedy clubs. He sort of had to do, he had to kind of find places. Art centres, arts labs, yeah. or, or benefits, or trade well, unions. I always think or... poor John Dowie because he just came just a bit too soon. Yeah. And me and Cliff went, and Bill, I mean, Cliff anyway, yeah. went to see him at the Bush in 76, 77. Yeah. I thought this is brilliant. Yeah, no, he, I, mean, he, I mean, he was, yeah. And, and actually, by the time. But by the time it all came along, he was so pissed off. Well, yeah. <laughs> that he, he, and he But also, he had an hour. He didn't yeah. have like five minutes, so yeah. he couldn't come and. He couldn't, his rhythm was wrong. I mean, yeah, he's one yeah. of. The, he's one of the. He's one of the great the unknown lost, comics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. and also Should from be a an, e yeah, from an era where it's it. barely documented. I mean, if you if you you know, because now everyone, people doing their first five minutes, someone's camera phones it, and it's on YouTube. It's hardly. Yeah. There's about four minutes footage of John Dowie in yeah. existence. And he was he was one of the early one of the early yeah uh, fallen uh, martyrs of uh, comedy. But the early fallen <laughs> martyrs. Of comedy. Uh, uh, <laughs> a yeah. terrible sort of. <laughs> he's not dead, you know. He's, he's, yeah, he might as well be. He's not famous. <laughs> he never had his own TV series. He might as well be dead. Um, but so yeah, I, I just the, the, Brecht, the, the Brechtian cabaret troupe split up, and then just one Christmas, I had this idea. I suddenly thought, there's no comedy out there yeah. for people like me. You know, yeah. it's political, smart, about drugs, lifestyle. Mm. And so I just set about writing it. And then me and Bill, it was the only other guy left from the comedy troupe, and Cliff. 
we then set about, you know, performing. And then, like you say about John Dowie, that yeah, we, yeah. we again, there was nowhere to perform. Mm. We, um, student unions, yeah, little art centres, right, right. Uh, people's houses. Uh, yeah. You know, it was, it was, but it was difficult. To, and some, and you, sometimes you go to a place like we went, to, <laughs> we went to the tram shed, which was the I home the of, shed, um, yeah. what would you call those? Hale and Pace. Yeah. And they had a big following, and we'd never used mics before. And it, it just the bloke, the bloke who ran it, had to come on and say, "Hey, now give these lads a chance." Yeah, he had to give the audience <laughs> a talking to, because we were going down so badly. Yeah. So what? They had a gig there. So they they had a gig there, and they knew they had a pre alternative. Yeah, they just yeah. pre. Yeah. You know, nothing's nothing emerges. Yeah, yeah. It's like every invention is yeah. an agglomeration yeah. of what came before it, isn't it? Yeah. And when I sort of, you know, do the whole thing about it, it was me, I invented everything, there yeah. was nothing before me, but yeah. that's a self-serving lie. Well, actually, the book, the book's an interesting mixture. It's 99% modest, <laughs> yeah. with sudden flashes of incredible <laughs> arrogance. Yeah. Where, I mean, I love the one chapter where you end it, quite justifiably saying, you say, having, having talked very honestly about your fears when you're doing stand-up, your anxieties, your nervousness about it, the feeling you weren't good enough or whatever, you do end one of the early chapters by saying, I'm not saying that the uh, massive business that stand-up is today with stadiums and tours and all this wouldn't have happened without me, but it wouldn't have happened in the same way yeah. and at the same point. And, and actually, to, to me, the key, the key to it seems to be that reading this book, although admittedly it's written by you, it seems to me <laughs> yes. that, um, without this select yourself figure. No, what it seems to be is that, is that for, for better or worse, as all these different people that wanted to do a different sort of thing in about 78, 79, 80 were coming together, they, you were one of the people that gave it an ideology. Yeah. And, and, it, and its ideology was, let's not do racism, let's not do sexism, let's not do, let's not do all those tropes. And whether that was politically a right, the right thing to do or not, which is something other people can argue about, it certainly meant that it had ground rules and it had a, and it had a dogma like in, and it had a, uh, a manifesto. And all great art movements, you know, need some sort of manifesto. And the manifesto, you know, got the, you wouldn't have this now if it hadn't had something to no, start if from. It had yeah. that something, and yeah. then and then later yeah. on, you know, yeah. people. Yeah. Betray the revolution. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at you, Ben. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, well, actually, the, the Trotskys, well, you know, the Stalins I mean, well, come along later. But, well, when I yeah. when I first came to the next comedy store venue, after the after you know, it's uh, ten years after you had been part of the group that had got it going. Yeah. It was entering a phase where there was a sort of ironic reaction to that dogma, yeah. where people that probably didn't even really feel like that felt an obligation to be slightly homophobic or sexist because it. Because it was um, different the, against the yeah, previous regime. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the book, in a sense, is also, it's not only, it's an account of being that figure, that spearhead. And then I think it also goes on to a point where I'm starting to think, hang on a minute, I'm being left behind. Mm. You know, I mean, that, that bit where, which is absolutely true, where I go and see the young ones on tour in, in, um, in Oxford. Yeah. And then I have to be taken home with what appears to be f very severe flu. And in fact, it's just envy. Envy. Yeah, just with the physical manifestation Poisonous, of envy. Yeah, it's like flu. Yeah, it's streaming those, out of you. Yeah, yeah. A, a weakness in the limbs, yeah. shaking. You know, yeah. visual conf I confusion. I got that actually. I got that once when I, I when I gave up for a bit, and I went to see a comic who had always said he was massively influenced by me, and said he was, and said that uh, without me, blah blah blah. Yeah. And I went to see him, and I went, yeah, well, I can see that, you know, and I could see it. In his act, which was to f go into 500 people in a big theatre, yeah, and I was sort of got the shakes of thinking I need to do this again because yeah. um, I don't mind being forgotten, but I don't want to be forgotten and but live on in a half remembered version of someone else's yeah. act. You know, and it's weird. Like, you don't realise you've got an ego, and you don't like to think you have, but then sometimes no. Well, when you're, you're when you're our kind of comic, yeah, yeah you think yeah. you're all you're yeah. all kind of artistic intent, but yeah, there's tremendous. You know, yeah. nobody's a comic who's not propelled by tremendous kind of ego. But uh, I just think, I just thought it was an, in, you know, an interesting task to, to give an account, at least, and the next one, if I do another one, we'll, be, we'll carry on with that. It's about, it's about being an artist and it's yeah. about being an innovative artist. And one of the things that happens if you're an innovative, innovative artist is people take what's innovative about you, strip away all the, 
the shit that you think is important and just fucking say, you know, just yeah. do the commercial, yeah. take your commercial core. Yeah. And how do you react to that? You know, it's a, it's a, it's well, a, it's well, a, you know, a I really, thing, you know? I, I, th I really like the bit you, you talked about how in the early days of the comedy store, the other acts would sort of hang around drinking with the audience. And you didn't feel that Alexi Sale could do that because he needed to, them, to intimidate them and for them to dislike him or hate him or be frightened of him. So he couldn't go around no. saying, do you want a pint? And, um, and of course, the knock-on effect of that is you, you have this very powerful stage thing, but you can't do all the networking stuff. You can't no. go on... I, I, again, I had a point about five years ago I was being asked to go on chat shows. I thought, I can't do that because you, you sort of spoil the thing then. Yeah. And if it, the more... It, and, for it you, it's just made for a fucking boring Saturday night for I know, me, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's couldn't, terrible. Yeah. I had to stay backstage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, locked yeah, away. Yeah. I know, it's so, awful. So, you know, in, in a way, the promotion... And now I don't care. Well, the promotional opportunities and the network opportunities weren't available to you because, the, because you, couldn't, you couldn't sort of go true. and be that... You, you couldn't have done Alexi Sale, the stage character, on Wogan, could you? <laughs> you no. You couldn't have sat there with your hat pulled down. <laughs> and I couldn't shouting. be me. And at that point, I couldn't be me, <laughs> no. Alexi, who's like... Got no, you know. Yeah, it's very little. It's got very little connection with yeah. that man. Yeah, the shouting, you know, the, the crazy guy. So yeah, I was exactly. I, I was very hampered by. I think that. There's a great quote there, though, in, from your from Linda, where you you said that, you know, a lot of people in their twenties and thirties spend all their time worrying that the best thing was happening somewhere else, but during the eighteen months, the first year, eighteen months of the comedy store and the start of the comic strip you both knew that you were at exactly the most interesting yeah. thing that you would have liked to have been at, yeah. which was those nights that that gig yeah. was starting. And that's something that, I mean, again, that's why, in a way, you should write a book about it, because that's not, that's not something that's given to many people. No. You know, because it's a rare thing to be yeah. at the Cavern Club. In fact, Linda was at the Cavern Club when the Beatles were playing. Or to be at Sun Records. So it's her, then, that gets these things going. <laughs> yeah, oh, she's much more. <laughs> she's much more prescient than me, She's, she could do stand-up. Right. She would have been a much better actor. Right. Right? But, uh, but no, to be that, and that's one of the things I really ch wanted to try and get across because it's such a rare thing, is to be in that place, to be, you know, you know whatever, you know, Sun City, where, you know, yeah, to yeah. be in Memphis when Elvis yeah. was, uh, you know, to be in Paris in the, you know, with Picasso and, uh, so on in the twenties, you know, was um, something I really want to communicate, and that is yeah, that yeah. is that is something that I, I am endlessly grateful for, and remind yeah. myself about. But it is communicated really well. But it's all, but what's also communicated is the situations that allowed that to happen, which was social housing, squats, though those sorts of jobs. Because even when you're on the front of Time Out, being written about as Britain's most exciting new comedian, you've still got a three day a week job still teaching, teaching, yeah, yeah. And, and all that. Riding a bicycle yeah. route. Well, in fact, you were, and you were doing a lot of the sorts of jobs as well that people would now be it would be unpaid internships, yeah. like the freelance illustrating. I, I like I like the all the stuff about being in seventies London and the sorts of people you you met, and there were a lot of um, laugh out loud bits in the book, which I know is like a mad cliche. That because that's people... the other thing I wanted to do was also to make it funny as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. Not... As well as not, you know, it's it's a very it's a very it's a very funny book. You, t you, t you write a lot about going to cinema in the seventies and how, yeah. which I think, <laughs> yeah. but this but this is good because you, you and you, you you talk about how a man of a similar age in the seventies might have been talking about Led Zeppelin or David Bowie or some jazz musicians they like. Your heroes and the people whose careers you seem to be follow seem to be hard left revolutionary <laughs> guerrillas from various <laughs> Marxist uprisings sure. around the world. Was... Right, so you're in the news. You're in, the, you're in the cinema. One weekend, when she was visiting me in London, Linda and I went to the Ogin in Leicester Square to see the newly released Sylvester Stallone movie, Rocky. Before the lights went down, I noticed in the audience a few rows behind me, a mournful-looking, slightly pop-eyed, balding man with a droopy moustache. I whispered to Linda, you see that man in the fifth row? I think it's Waleed Jumblat, leader of the Druze militia from the Chief Mountains of the Lebanon. You're always saying that, she replied. <laughs> Yes, I hissed. But this time I'm certain. The Druze sect were much in the news because they were one of the fractions fighting in the Lebanese Civil War, which over the next ten years would tear the country apart. I paid close attention to the coverage of the conflict on the TV news because I was always hoping to catch a glimpse of one of the young Arab men who used to come to our flat in Finchley. 
then I'd be able to say, hey, isn't that Ahmed managing the 45-0 machine gun at the PLO roadblock? Which I thought would make me seem awfully sophisticated to whoever I was talking to. After the film finished, I approached the man with a moustache and said to him, excuse me, are you Waleed Jumblat, leader of the Druze militia from the Chief Mountains of Lebanon? Yes, I am, he said. What did you think of the film then? I asked after a pause. It was all right. <laughs> <laughs> Because a lot of them. <laughs> so you saw Rocky with him? Yeah, well, he's well, doing that. Like, yeah, yeah, he's doing it. Yeah, the Druze, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of them, like a lot of them, um, that particular era of, of, of Arab, you know, before the, 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 what, the jihadis, yeah. they, they'd been to like Portsmouth Polytechnic. Yeah, yeah. I think Wally Jumblad probably <laughs> studied at like, you yeah. know, he'd been, he'd, yeah. he'd done, he'd done they'd modern had a good, They'd had a good Leeds. liberal education. Yeah, 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 often in Britain, though, because yeah, of the yeah. links with Britain or France. Yeah. Or, you know, a lot of them, uh, yeah, a lot, like a lot of the, the, the Arabs, you know, I write mm. here, a lot of the Arabs who, who came to our house, you know, been to Liverpool University yeah, yeah. or whatever, and now, like the, the bloke, oh, it's not in this, I, I, one of the blokes who lived with Washington be, later on became King Hussein's brother-in-law, his right. sister married King Hussein of Jordan, right. and he'd done physics at Liverpool yeah, University. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Small world. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of, uh, there's, there, there were loads of bits like that that had me laughing on the train while people, um, <laughs> Well, people look at you. I liked all the stuff about. Um, I like the stuff about finding the costume. Yes. And, and, I, and it hadn't, again, it hadn't struck me before because when I first became aware of you, you were already in that look that we associate with the '80s Alexi Sale of um, the tight mod suit that you looked like a, a two-tone kind of look almost. And and then I see early photos. And I think maybe even in that film that's made at the at the comedy store. Uh, the, the, I think I'm in the yeah. super. Certainly in the photos which yeah. are on the stairs yeah. here. You're in the yeah. leather jacket, leather and, jacket and chinos. Yeah. And, it, and it's and and right when I look at that, I think, oh right, who's that guy? Why is he on stage talking? But when you're in that suit, you go, well, he's on stage talking because for some reason he is a comedian, <laughs> and he's got to. He's got to fill that time up, but all he knows about is Willie Jumblatt and <laughs> yeah. sort of mad, you know, you know. And so, it, when you the, the, when you talk about when you saw that suit, yeah, in the in the Oxfam shop in yeah. Putney, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was a, well, it, you know, I, th I mean, again, I think one of the things that the book is, I mean, I think is in a way you you try to do with yours. I think it's important to also provide something of a handbook for yeah. for for other performers, yeah, yeah. you know, to show how you how you arrived yeah. at your your methods, you know, and and. And and you look and they, it, it, it's it's kind of magical, I think, really the way you know uh, you know once I found that look, it was it was but it, it was always I mean you, you can get quite kind of magical realism about it in a way that you think it was all you know I was meant to see that suit and it looked yeah. like I mean I got a kind of fantasy that it was one of the four tops or whatever had been <laughs> had left it in a boarding house. You know, yeah, and yeah. the owner had sold it, and it ended up in the Oxfam shop in Putney yeah. High Street. And uh, I mean, first of all, it was just my good suit, you know. And then something happened. Well, I wore it on stage one night, and it re it just suddenly went really tight and stupid looking. Mm. Or maybe it had always been like that. And then, and also going bald, you know, which yeah, was yeah. a horrible, horrible experience. Yeah. But was fortuitous because it meant that I shaved my head, you know. Which in an in an era when people didn't really, apart from Neil Brenner, there was nobody who did that. It just it just felt magical when it when it finally that I was I became that guy you know yeah. rather than a kind of a prototype of that yeah, guy. Yeah. But on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with being a you have to, you you oh, can't yeah. be stretching. It's nothing wrong with being the prototype, no, you know, no, no, the no. early version, you know. Another thing I thought was in, in, was interesting about that was that you know when when Thatcher died, for example, you're wheeled out as uh, the <laughs> critic of the right. Okay, but. In, in so much of the stuff in those routines is also an attack on the left wing support base on the, yeah. on the on the on the voters on the sorts of people you, you brilliantly identify that 70s 80s emergence of you know the sort of polytechnic educated lower middle class working class who suddenly had consumer goods created for them lifestyle choices things from habitat um, watching Channel Four films, you know, and, 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 yeah, which which as a teenager, 
you, I, that's, I thought, God, I hope I can grow up to be like that. It sounds brilliant to be yeah, like a, yeah. a Guardian reading 80s oh, left-wing adult. But, but they're very much the target of your, of your rage as well. And, and I, so I think it, it's great because they, and that would have been the room, the people in the room. So it, no, wasn't, yeah. like, it wasn't like this thing of going, here are the others. No. And it also wasn't the thing people do like, oh, we all do this, we're all like that. It's going, you're like this, and you're all cunts. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> class, yeah, exactly. And they loved it, you know, which is like, you know. Yeah. But yeah, uh, my rage was, I always felt much more rage with uh, uh, the left than the right, really, you know. Uh, well, because you didn't have any expectations of them. No, of course yeah. they just, So you let down by you know, them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They were betrayed constantly by the left. Yeah. Like, I remember doing a benefit in Brockwell Park with, for the march for, what was it called? The, the, the TUC arranged to march some blo poor bloody unemployed kids endlessly yeah. up and down the country. Um, mar people's march for jobs, I think. Yeah. Well, I remember there was a left-wing photographer called Red Saunders, and he said to me, you should be doing stuff about Thatcher, not against your audience. I thought, well, I fuck, I don't want to do that. You know, mm. I don't know Thatcher. Yeah. Like you say, she hasn't let me, I mean, she's, only, she's just being what she, she never pretended to be yeah. nothing that she isn't. Really, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, that again. That's but again. That's tied in with the emergence of that audience, isn't it? Of, of, of society allowing that. Um, and they did. That. I mean, it, I mean, sometimes I used to be criticised for, for um, you know, that the audience that I was doing stuff, I was satirising an audience who loved yeah. being satirised. No, I mean there was a there was a strong element. You know, what, the, what are you going to do? You know. I know yeah, yeah. But also there was always a strong. I mean, do I say it in the book? There was always like a lot of army in, yeah. in my shows and a yeah. lot of police. and People who liked the violence. They liked, exactly. The rage. And they knew yeah. the police, yeah. I think, who used to come and see me. Yeah. yeah, they loved the rage. And they also knew that everything was a lie because they saw society. I mean, they were part of the problem. Part of the problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the but they, they yeah. loved me because yeah. of the violence and because I was telling the truth, you know. And they weren't li liberal, lefty. Yeah. Lecturers, you there's, know. A, there's a nicely self-aware thing in the, throughout the book, though, that I think ties in with what you're saying about uh, you're attacking your core audience. But there's, all, there's a thing where, you know, to quote that Groucho, famous Groucho Marx phrase that gave the club its name, <laughs> you wouldn't want to belong to a club that have it, uh, have it as a member. And you identify yourself as part of a generation who, being educated, allowed you to then move into a place where you would never quite belong anyway. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I mean, even with, with me, like it was 10, 15 years later, no one had been to university in that family. And then when you'd gone to university, they imagined that you would then emerge as an executive or something. Yeah. Not someone who wanted, who, because they'd had a liberal education, then wanted to do something absolutely pointless that would probably not make any money. Yeah. It was very bewildering. Yeah. And, you'd, and the, you described this socially in terms of, the, the the thing that you you'll move through into a position where you feel you don't belong, and yeah. also that you you get asked on these benefits like the secret policeman's ball, with the famous celebrities, but you don't go on at the end for the mass sing along. No, you sort of stand in the wings doing a little dance on yeah. your own. Yeah, like, but I wouldn't. I hated that when they all went on and sang "I Shall Be Released." Yeah. I thought puke. Under, I couldn't go home, so I'd, yeah, I just sort of stand. Yeah, that's kind of like, yeah. it's like a really great metaphor for the whole yeah. thing. Like, you've been, yeah. it's been, it's been, it's been uh, look at all them in that world of celebrity. Well, you can come in if you like. Well, I'm not no. going in there. No. You know? But on the other hand, I'm not, I'm not like going to, you know, left. I'm just going to stand about and, you know, not quite, I'm not going home either. Yeah, but then the good thing about that is it's not, you're not sort of, you're not, the memory of those things of yours then are not compromised in any way, because you're sort of, yeah, sort of like this spectral figure, sort of. But this is an amazing bit. I mean, this is sort of, this is a sort of, for me. I mean, it's like a kind of axis on which the lives of so many people I know have changed. Every week, Linda would buy the Cyrical magazine Private Eye from a kiosk on Fulham Broadway. One day in April 79, she showed me a tiny advert almost lost amidst the junk in the back pages. It said, comedians wanted for new comedy and improvisation club opening in West One. I felt a rush of excitement. This was what I'd been looking for, a comedy club such as they had in the United States. Admittedly, my knowledge of what a comedy club in the United States was like was patchy as it was based solely on the Dustin Hoffman film, Lenny. <laughs> right, but again, I, even 10 years later, we didn't, we, it didn't know what really stand up was. I mean, at exactly that period, Andy did a tour, 
got a grant off the Arts Council, didn't he, to go to New York to watch stand-up. Did he? Yeah, he got a grant because he felt like he... And the Arts Council went, yeah, because you couldn't look at it on YouTube. No, there wasn't no, any no. films. And you know what? One of the closest records you had was the Lenny Bruce film where he's doing a not-great impression of... Done Dustin Hoffman's doing Lenny Bruce. So yeah. You sort of see, oh, that's what a comedy club looked that like. That must be what it looks like. Didn't yeah. really have anything. No, you know? no, and that's that mm -hmm. was particularly poor. You could, if you made an effort, you could get records. And, yeah, yeah. You know, of like um, Lenny Bruce or, um, you know, I didn't do any of that. I just whatever happened to me, that was all. I didn't seek out, you know, source material or anything. It, I just saw that Lenny Bruce film and I thought that was enough for me. That really. advert, as they do, I mean, it's really the equivalent of Don Ward and Peter Rosengard just throwing a bottle in the sea, isn't it? With a, with a note. They were, I mean, again, that is, I mean, that's where you start thinking about magical realism because they were, until I turned up, they were in terrible, terrible trouble. You know, there was nobody. There was nobody. I mean, what the first night would have been like without me, I can't imagine. I mean, this, this place, Don and his house in the south of France wouldn't have existed without... Um, yeah, again, I say something else would have happened. You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not arrogant. What well, you're well, saying, something else would have happened because there was a pressure valve waiting to blow. Well, speaking as a max, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, um, you know, there's the social conditions existed yeah. for yeah. a new kind of comedy. You know, and it, you see that, you know, it's happened in certainly in the English-speaking world in Australia and in mm. Canada or whatever without my intervention, but it's not. It's without, it had a particular vibrant character, with, with not just me, but with me and Tony and Keith yeah. and all them people, that it, might, it probably would have been a more pallid thing without me. Right. But, I mean, the, 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 the fact that Linda saw the advert as well, yeah. your wife, and it's not even, even you, I mean, it's just like the... the uh, it's an amazing thing. I mean, do you think, do you think that you talk about the social conditions being right and you don't go into a lot of detail about it, you talk really brilliantly about how you write a really funny paragraph about one day you write, you're cycling past Chelsea Art School and you see tonight the Sex Pistols, you think, well, that sounds really good, but then you go to the pub instead yeah, and on. miss their second ever gig. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the way, yeah, yeah, you've written yourself out of history, that's like being on the side of the stage, yeah. you know. Well, that's what but, it was, yeah. But was it, was it, was it, I mean, I know Keith, I've got some singles of Keith Allen in quite decent bands of that period, yeah, yeah. but was it, a, was it a punk thing? It was a punk, it took the, the, the attitude, the, what, the crucial difference I think between being a, a comic even, what, we took a lot of influence from punk, the mm. audience and the attacking the audience yeah, yeah. and all that stuff, but the one thing, you can't be a comic and be fucked up, you can't do it, no. be drunk or on yeah. drugs by yeah. and large, yeah. relatively speaking, that's the crucial difference yeah. between being a musician um, being a comic, even yeah. if you are taken as your influence, punk, yeah. you, there's always a cold okay. intellect. Yeah, you have there's to. Somebody sober. So it takes you a long time to figure it out, but but you have to fabricate the, the yeah. levels of madness that yeah. you get, an intensity that you get from In amphetamines sense, yeah. or alcohol. And sometimes people go through those and come out the other side, having learnt from them. But yeah. I think it's like. You can't, you can't. It's a fake. It's what the can't a comic, no matter how punky he's seeming, mm. he isn't. And there's a bit, I don't know if I do, but there's a bit when, when in the young ones, when Rip Rig and Panic are yeah, on, yeah. I think, and, and one, of them, one of the musicians goes, we were here, so I'm just oh, these, these, fucking, these beers are real, I'm going to drink. And I said, no, no, continuity. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, don't move it's a nice that. Moment, that. It's yeah. already, been, yeah. yeah. So when you came to do the young ones, they, did they basically created a sort of, slot for you every week to do yeah. something and that program if you were a teenager in britain in the in the 80s when the young ones came on it was an amazing thing where you felt like for the first time there was something in a piece of light entertainment that had some relationship with people that you knew your understanding of the world the things you found ridiculous um, it had a, had a less energy level, and yet it was much cleverer than its critics realised, because it was referencing all sorts of smart ass things that you would only know about. If you, yeah. you know, and I mean, uh, it's uh, impossible to underestimate the impact of that. I think. Yeah, yeah, and I was. I mean, I knew as soon as I saw, the, I think, the script for the pilot. I thought this is what I should have been doing all yeah. along, but I shouldn't have really. I don't know. I, OT, I mean, OTT made me a, a national. Celebrity, yeah. I suppose, but I thought if I could just have waited, yeah, 
for the young ones to come along then really I needn't have I needn't have gone through all that nightmare that I went through with OTT. You know? well, well how much freedom did um did uh, Ben Elton and Lisa Mayer get in it in it in in writing it and in casting it because it always it always seemed to me seeing the, the the comic strip films that Peter Richardson should have been the Mike character. Yeah, well, did, well that's a famous. I mean, right, that's right. that Peter was such a good, Peter and, and Paul Jackson hated each other, right? right. So, not from the start, but pretty early on. Um, yeah, that part the Mike role was obviously written for Peter Richardson, and then he had a row with with Paul and. Called him a cunt and, and um, stormed off. You know, I actually sort of think that it's better that there's not another. It might have overbalanced if there'd been another comic. If Peter had right, been, right. I mean, obviously Chris Ryan is is a thankless task playing Mike, but yeah. um, I think it's better that he does it. You know, than than another yet another comic really. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Peter won. I mean, that's why. I mean, Peter's an extraordinary control freak, and yeah. uh, he. Um, and that's why he did the comic strip, and he was in charge of absolutely everything. You know. I mean, you you write in it about how the energy levels and the violence and the danger in it were achieved basically by people putting themselves in dangerous, violent, unsupervised situations, and then often having to finish the shoot in front of a studio audience with a bleeding head or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, Kind of, do you get that from from Rick and Aid stunts in those ones? Just sort there of was no safety gear. There no. was no, there was explosions and you know. Oh, yeah, you had an explosion go off in your face, didn't you? No, that was in the film, wasn't it? In uh, that on Gorky, Gorky Park, Park, which I write about. I had a, yeah, an yeah. explosive charge on my head. Yeah, that I had no backing. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was. Well, I mean, you and you also asked about. I mean, it was. You asked about casting Rick and Lisa and Ben. We just cast our mates by and large. Yeah. If you think that, I know, all this you know, everybody's in there. Jim yeah. Barkley and you know, Tony Allen. The, the, the amount of negotiation that it took to get Tony in that fucking show. Right. I think Tony, he, had to, he actually put it in the thing that he had to turn to the camera and make a kind of statement. About yeah, it's all Tony Allen was a, you know, extremely principled sort of refused yeah. Nick, wasn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. And still is. And... Uh, I, I think Keith wasn't in it, but yeah, um, Dawn and Jennifer, as I say that, you know, Jim Barkley, uh, Steve Frost, Mark Hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's they would. I think we would cast. They would cast their mates first of all, and then the the, the regulars from the, the the comedy store was the first sort of alternative comedy club, I suppose, wasn't it? And the, the regulars there were yourself, uh, Tony Allen, um, Jim Barkley, Andy De La Tour, Pauline Melville. Yeah, was, no, Paulie, was Paulie wasn't there. Was um, uh, Arnold Brown there? Arnold was yeah. there every week, yeah. But when, when the comic strip opens down the road, 18 months later, about 200 yards away, and that is yourself, um, uh, Red Rick, Rick Mayle, Nade Edmondson, yeah. French and Saunders. French and Saunders come slightly later. Yeah, yeah but it's, a, it's got a, it had a higher hit rate for people that became household names. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Because it didn't have the political edge? Or... Because they weren't they weren't people that were the stuff was more palatable in some ways, or were they or, or had the ground rules been laid so they were able to do more stuff with them? Because they were better. Because they were better. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were right. just better. Right. Yeah. In the um, in the book you write about when Robin Williams came to the uh, the comedy store, mm. which at that point would have been going about six months, I suppose. Yeah, I yeah. Guess, yeah. He, 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 you say he, he, he got in a cab and he said to a cab driver, take me to a comedy club. And you, you wonder what <laughs> the cab driver knew that meant he took him to the yeah. comedy store because it could equally have well been the Circus Tavern Purfleet. Yeah. Where he would have ended up on a 1970s mainstream bill with, Jimmy, with Cricket. Jimmy Cricket. Yeah. yeah. And then he would have. And so it, <laughs> it, again, it's, it's really amazing that it happened because if he'd arrived in London a year earlier and said, take me to a comedy club, there wouldn't have been anywhere anyway. No, there Which might again, have been. interesting, an American yeah. would assume there must be. Yeah. But there wasn't in the same way. It must have been the talk of the town. Yeah. Somewhere. So what was, um, but, so did you know him as a stand-up then or did you just know him from like Mork and Mindy and things like that? I just knew him from Mork and Mindy. But so you didn't know what it was going to be like? I don't know if I, no, although I sort of, I wasn't surprised. You could see... Um, you could see that he was a stand-up. I mean, I knew, 
I liked watching Morecambe. I mean, again, because it was shown as a kids' show, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you knew it was a much more, that this, that there was a much cleverer mind. Yeah, yeah. And also the girl, I mean, Pam Dover is yeah, adorable. Yeah, really funny. Yeah, 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 and then funny as well, you know. Yeah. There's a real chemistry between them. And I just knew that Robin was coming from watching him on Morecambe. And you could right. see that he would basically be doing stand-up, really, for minutes on end really, yeah. in a spacesuit. Um, <laughs> well, you know, you need the suit to define the character. You know? <laughs> and I, I think by then I might have read about him or something. Yeah. I can't remember. Um, but I knew who he was. So what was it like seeing that sort of American act in Britain in 1979 at that, at that short, close distance, at close range? It was it was incredible. It was uh, that's the first time I saw him. It was extraordinary. Just just to, I think I said about like I'd been kicked down the stairs laughing. It'd be difficult for people to have plagiarised your act in that period, wouldn't it, word for word, because it came, it had a particular vocabulary and a particular sensibility. But obviously, there's an energy. There was an energy level about it. That was unlike anything else we'd seen. Yeah, and you could, and in fact, the idea that the alternative comedian was someone who shouted a lot about swearing that became, you must have done really well because that became the tabloid stereotype of them, didn't it? You know, we that know was what a description are. of me. <laughs> 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 but I used to pre preempt that, didn't I? I used to, yeah. I mean, that was my opening line yeah. at the comic strip. Was yeah. say, "I'm an alternative comedian. I'm not funny. I'm non-sexist. I'm non-racist. So if you don't laugh at me, you're a Nazi shitbag." bag." 